All right, so hopefully everyone can hear me okay, or, or should I grab the mic? It's good? Okay. So, um, yeah, this is titled Incomplete Views. Um, I'm going to be talking about network incident response sort of as it actually happens rather than maybe um, how we think it might. Who am I? Well, I'm a senior security engineer and I'm, I'm with F5 Networks. Uh, and uh, I'm also a member of the F5 Security Incident Response Team, which is essentially a group within our support organization that uh, helps customers when they are under attack. Uh, it's actually something that we just offer to everybody. It's not a charged for a service. They can call in and they can say, help, we need some assistance. And we try to help them out as best as we can. Um, so because of that, I end up talking to a lot of different customers under a lot of different kinds of attacks with a lot of different strategies and capabilities in terms of network response. So essentially this, or network incident response. So this is essentially me trying to um, tell you some things that I've seen and learned uh, from that experience of being a fly on the wall in a bunch of different kinds of contexts. Uh, and I should say, this is not a vendor presentation. I'm not going to be mentioning specific vendor technology, certainly not my, the company that I work for, nor anybody else's. Uh, this is going to be relatively high level and process focused to a great extent, although we will get into some specifics of specific um, broad technical uh, tool sets and so forth that you might want to use. So the next question that I have is, I don't actually really know who attends B-Sides. I mean, I know we're all interested in information security in some way or another. So I want to just ask a couple of questions to kind of get a sense of, of where you're all at and what you're interested in. Uh, so how many of you have done or do incident, uh, incident response in some way or another? Great. Um, how many of you think you do it really, really, really well? <laughs> oh, come on. I mean, no, OK. Um, and um, let's see, what's, what's another good question to ask? Um, how many of you uh, feel that the biggest issue that you have with the way that you do incident response is your tool set, like what products you have or what capabilities you have on that technical level? OK, one or two, right? And how many of you feel that it's much more of a, um, a matter of communication and uh, how do I want to put it? Communication with human groups, uh, it, essentially human resource stuff. OK, yeah, great. OK, so we got the right audience. That's great. So what I'm going to be talking about, it's not about forensics. I'm not going to be going into anything about determining what happened uh, you know, after the attack. I'm not going to be talking about attribution. Um, and I'm not going to be talking about detecting implants or threat hunting or, or any of these sorts of things because the sort of incidents that I've typically been involved in um, uh, don't really go into those areas. Those happen off scene. Um, the main thing that what I've been able to do is help customers respond to attacks while they are happening. And the goal of that is essentially just emergency response, right? They, they are suffering some sort of a situation that is inhibiting their ability to, to perform their business. Their site's down, their database is slow, their uh, accounts are getting locked out, whatever it happens to be. It's, ha it's a direct and impactful situation for them. So the goal that we are trying to do is just get them to the point where they can stop the bleeding, take a breath, and then figure out what to do next, right? So that's, that's really the scope of the incident response. There are, of course, lots of other parts of incident response that you have to go through, but the talk is going to be focused on this. Um, and a lot of it has to do with preparation. But this is the sort of thing that I've had the chance to see. Some of these, probably everybody's seen SIM floods, UDP floods, ICMP floods, um, GET floods, right? Uh, pseudo random subdomain attacks against DNS, that's another good one. Uh, but we've also seen things like kind of massive SQL injection attempts against um, web apps. We see a lot of brute force authentication attacks, uh, certainly against SSH. I mean, everybody, anybody who runs an exposed SSH server gets brute forced like constantly but also against web apps and pretty much anything that you can possibly stick a username and password into. Um, we've seen some very interesting things with computational attacks 
against databases, and, and in case anybody know, doesn't really quite know what I mean by a computational attack, I mean a denial of service attack that leverages the ability to make something do more computations than you want it to, right? So a really good example of this was a company that had a web-based API that was for finding a provider. And I'm sure you've seen these sort of things, like type in your zip code, um, type in the kind of provider you want, like a medical provider or whatever, and we'll show you the doctor's offices in your area. Well, somebody, and I don't know who it was, but whoever was attacking them had decided that the, the best thing for them to do was to set, they figured out that they could actually use coordinates in the API call to determine where you were. They set the coordinates to be in the middle of the Indian Ocean, right? And they said the kind of provider that they wanted to get was like, everybody, you know, show me everything. Show me unlimited, you know, all of them. So one little get request to that API, and suddenly their database was having to scan every single row. And their database blew up. Okay. That's a really good example of a computational attack. Um, we also occasionally see uh, essentially vulnerability based denial of service. Um, you know, obviously we're thinking about vulnerabilities in terms of remote, remote code execution, et cetera, but there is a huge classification of vulnerabilities that people have to deal with that are basically just, I can send you a particular kind of network flow and your stuff will break. Your switch will fall over, your firewall will reboot, your um, proxy device will crash, whatever it happens to be. And these are really great because they're, from an attacker perspective, because even if you have high availability infrastructure where you've got failovers and all this sort of things going on, I can just send one here and send one there and send one there and send one there and just hold everything down for as long as I want. So also interestingly enough, and this one I, I was actually kind of surprised by, um, web scraping is kind of a thing now. Um, competitors scrape each other's websites to find out uh, how much the uh, opposition is charging for things um, or for a whole variety of reasons. In fact, there's an entire, I think I'll call it a botnet, uh, sneaker, they, actually some people call it sneaker net, that exists solely to troll sneaker seller sites to find the most awesome sneakers to buy. It's all very, very automated because the sneaker heads love their sneakers. It is legitimate in the sense that they just want to get the sneakers before everybody else does, right? They're customers. But a misconfigured sneaker net can certainly take down a website um, if the traffic level is high enough or if there's some, if they trip over some sort of vulnerability that happens. We've also seen some stuff that's been in the news like GRE flooding with the Mirai botnet. Uh, that was what hit um, uh, Krebs uh, on security. I don't know if you all heard about that. It was like 600 gigabits a second or something insane like that. Uh, and a lot more. So this is the obligatory warning slide. No one in this room needs to hear this, but I'm gonna say it anyways, just in case. Um, if you uh, haven't been hit by some of these things, you're probably gonna get hit by some of these things at some point. Um, some of the companies that I work for or work with, just this is a cost of business. They are under constant attack. I had a, a kind of fun discussion with one of them. They sent me a packet capture and they said, can you tell me what's wrong or tell me what's going on? And I looked at it and immediately I was like, oh, you're under a massive sin flood. And they're like, oh yeah, we know about that. I'm like, okay. Yeah, we, do, we don't care. Like 40% of our network traffic is, is floods. But it doesn't impact our business, so we don't care. We, we have some mitigations, whatever, you know. What we actually wanna know is what is this particular HTTP request doing? Ah, okay, well then I can help you. But for most companies, this doesn't happen all the time, right? It happens every so often, and that and it's that that lack of predictableness of it that is really one of the key things that I want to uh, talk about because it makes it really hard to prepare for it. If you don't have a plan in place to try to address these these sorts of attacks, every time they hit you, it's going to be a mad scramble, right? You're just going to everyone's going to freak out and have to run around and figure out what to do. And what I'm trying to say is that probably there is a better way to do it. So um, one of the things that surprised me, though, about some of these things is um, the lack of detection. Detection is apparently really hard. Um, 
People don't do detection super well. And, and part of it is because we are so operationally focused that until something becomes a problem, we don't really notice or care about it in some ways, right? Um, so we don't necessarily put the effort into trying to detect the slow and incremental rise in the number of authentication attempts. We may not think about that, or we may not care that our network bandwidth is slowly creeping up over the course of several hours until it actually gets to the point where the servers are getting slow. Um, so, for example, uh, I have seen numerous brute force attacks that were detected when the authentication system stopped working. That is probably not when you want to detect the brute force. Uh, I have seen many web scraping situations where, in this particular case, um, there was a company that was providing a service that leveraged another service in a separate company. It was like a back-end database or something that they had. That company called the first company and said, why are you DOSing us? <laughs> and they were like, what do you mean? <laughs> Turns out that somebody was web scraping through this first company and that was generating just a, a ton of traffic on the back end. The first company was better set up to handle that level of load. They didn't really notice that there was a problem, but the back end fell over and so it be rapidly became a problem because the, the, the back end company was gonna be like, unless you stop this, we are cutting off your contract. You are going to go out of business. Okay, <laughs> maybe it's an emergency now. Generally speaking, right, detection comes after or because there's some kind of a problem, as I said. So this tends to lead to a mad scramble, and we should probably do better than that. Um, the other things that surprise me is, like, once I get on the phone, and, and I should say that um, there are quite a few customers who really know what they're doing, and they call up my company because they have one specific question about how to configure one of our devices to do a particular thing. And those are great, those are super easy. We just hand them the documentation or point, you know, tell them what to do and then they go away and it's lovely. And they know exactly what they're doing. But there are an awful lot of other companies that I've been on where I go on to a conference call with like 30 or 40 people all at once, including vendors, other vendors, uh, IT staff, security staff, Occasionally there's even like a CFO or a CEO who's actually on the call yelling at people um, because there's some site down situation that they're handling and it's a complete mess, right? It's a very strange experience to be a vendor who's helping out a company and being kind of the calm one who can kind of try to advise what steps we should be doing because uh, to be honest with you, I, it's not that big of a deal to me. I, I want to help them, but it's not my job on the line, I guess. Maybe that's one way I can be calmer than everybody else. But again, it doesn't really seem like we should be doing it. Um, another thing we run into all the time is in order to help out the customers, we need data, right? We need packet captures. We need configurations. We need some sort of in, uh, information to base our recommendations on. And it is surprisingly difficult for people to get this to us. They don't have pre-existing capabilities to get onto a switch or a router or a proxy or even a host to get a PCAP. They don't have log aggregation of any kind set up. They don't, they, and especially, a lot of times the reason is because I'm talking to the security person and the security person has to go over and ask the IT person who has to go ask the network ops person to get the data for them. And so it's this long chain of trying to get things and it slows us down. And because of that, usually, more often than I want to admit, the attack is over before we've actually gotten any data. And a lot of times the attack is over before we've actually been able to get any data that was about the attack. In other words, by the time we get to the point where we can get a PCAP, the attack's already gone. So the PCAP shows nothing, right? The attack's done. And we have no evidence and we have no way to say anything about it. So we also have a lack of analysis capabilities. Um, we have a lack of knowledge in environments about how to remediate things, like what points in their network they can actually implement controls. Sure, a firewall, but you gotta get a hold of the firewall team. The firewall team may not know how to do the specific kind of remediation you want. Um, and I'm not really blaming anybody for this. This is hard, I get it. Their the organizations are complex. Um, but I am trying to say we should probably try to improve it. One way in the industry we have typically tried to improve it is by providing 
super duper vendor tools to do a lot of this for us, right? And um, I am very aware, being uh, a vendor, that our tools are expensive and they're hard to configure. And I'm not speaking about F5 in particular, I'm speaking in general about vendor stuff. Um, they are expensive, they're hard to figure out how to use, you often have to change things to integrate them into your environment. Um, you can also try to shift the responsibility for dealing with attacks to things like uh, SOC as a service or scrubbing services or things like that. Those can be very expensive. Um, however, of course, uh, if you are actually gonna get subject to these attacks, they are costly. Um, they are, can be costly in terms of downtime, lost revenue, stress on your employees. Um, I have been on several situations where the people that on the phone that I was talking to had literally been up for 36 hours straight. Those people are not gonna be any good for anything else for a week after. Um, so can we prepare ourselves without having to spend a ton of money or commit ourselves to very specific vendor models or what have you, and I think we can. So what do we have to help ourselves out in incident response? Well, we may not have expensive tools, and we may not have deep security knowledge in our teams. Um, we may have very complex networks, very complex organizations, um, but what we do have is, or we can get, is data. We don't always have it at our fingertips, and I think that's one of the biggest problems, because we, what, we, what we need to do is get the right data, which is, I'll go into this a little bit later, the rightness of the data depends on the context in which it's gonna be used. We need to get it fast and we need to get it in front of people who can understand it and do something about it. And then we need to do something, take action, right? So we have the ability to generate a lot of data if we want, we all know this, right? I mean, you could, and some companies in fact do, capture every single packet that goes in or comes out of their network. Now, they do this sometimes with things like S-Flow, which is more of a metadata thing about source IP, destination IP, ports, and so forth. Some people do actual, like, full-on everything on the wire gets logged. That's great for uh, forensics. Uh, it is probably less good for incident response than you might imagine. Mainly because a 10 gigabit per second connection fully utilized will generate 1.25 gigabytes of capture file per second at least. Um, I have been handed 80 gig capture files in my job, and the biggest problem was finding a machine that I could open them on. <laughs> Double click on it, open it up in Wireshark, come back sometime the next day when it's finished loading, right? So, um, along with that, um, we can capture debug logging from every single process if you want. That might not do great things for application performance, but we could get it. Almost every system you're dealing with has SNMP, or could be made to use it. We could capture and graph every single MIB. Um, we can do all of the logging from our AVs and firewalls and IDS systems and everything else. Okay. We don't collect all of it because it's way too much and we don't have the room to store it and we don't have any analysis capabilities of dealing with it. Maybe you have a SIM and maybe your SIM is awesome and maybe you can take all this in, but then you still need to analyze it and you still need to figure out how to interpret it. So what we're trying to look for really is what's the sweet spot for incident response? Now I'm not saying that, that gathering all that information isn't useful in a whole bunch of different contexts, right? But we need to narrow down the focus of what information we're gonna gather to deal with incidents and have that at our fingertips. Um, so, I should say, too, that mitigation tools or mitigation points are kind of uh, uh, something that we need to think about. Um, obviously, you don't want to block, well, sometimes you do, actually. I, I had one customer who was a vendor in Canada, and for some reason or another, they only sold to Canada. That was their customer base. They could actually literally say that. We are only for Canadians. They were under attack from Pakistan and southern Sudan and Italy. I, I don't know, something like that. They were actually making the decision, we can use geolocation to just block anything that isn't coming from Canada. That was acceptable to them. Most people are not going to be in that situation, clearly. 
Um, so we need to have good mitigation techniques that will allow us to just block the stuff that we want to block and not interrupt any other businesses. But sometimes we just have to bring the hammer down and just say these are bad IPs and we're going to block them or whatever. So we can mitigate at different layers. Um, some of this is based on what you know, kind of like I know all my customers are just Canadians. That's a good example of that. Um, sometimes it's what you have access to. Um, clearly, there are tons of places within a network infrastructure that you can block things. Uh, you, as a security person, may not have access to all of those, and I'll get into a little bit more about how we can fix that later. Mm -hmm. But you use what you can, right? Um, and you generally want to block uh, as far forward as you can because if you block it on a, say, if you block it on a firewall, and this is pretty basic, if you block it on a firewall, it's going to be more efficient than trying to block it on your 50 web servers individually, right? All right. OK. So one of the funny things about data is that it's not value neutral in general. One might argue that a Wireshark capture, wide open Wireshark capture, is really just the bytes on the wire, and there's no inherent meaning in that. One might say that SNMP, SNMP counter data could be considered the same way. It's really just a, a fact that you can look at. But almost all the other logging that we do is uh, done for some specific purpose, and it is filtered in some way by the people who created that logging, right? I, I hope I'm making sense with this. Um, so applications, for example, log things that are useful to application developers. Those may not be the things that security engineers want to see. Um, people who log network performance data log it to tune the performance of their applications. They don't log it to detect attacks, necessarily. Um, quite often, applications just simply say, I'm working within parameters. And maybe they're, oh, maybe I didn't handle one request right, and they'll log that. That's great. It doesn't say, I'm misbehaving because I'm under attack, or because I'm receiving 100,000 more get requests than I usually am. Like, that sort of thing does not get logged. So help for developers, not so much for incident response. So we have to take into account into what kind of data we're going to look at. Moreover, uh, interpretation is actually a pretty specialized task. Um, network admins, hopefully, know how to interpret traffic graphs and PCAPs and logs from their switches and routers. Sysadmins know how to deal with system logs. Devs and app owners should know what their applications are saying. Uh, architects, oh, so now we're going to get into some other stuff. Architects should know when major changes have been planned. Vendors know that should at least know the log files that their devices generate. Um, and all of these folks can dig deeper into logs uh, and have expert knowledge to be able to interpret them that may not be present on your security team. So you're going to leverage all of these people, I think, to get the best bang for your buck. Because they know what normal looks like. Now, you have, to, you have a choice here. You can either have your security team be isolated and try to collect all the data themselves and keep it all secret and not tell anybody and say, we're in charge of security, or you can reach out and try to make relationships with all these other teams. Now, Esteban, who's in the audience, gave a really interesting talk about this very thing. I'm not going to quote Esteban's talk extensively, but I will point out that one of the things that he brings up is security is often this sort of walled off little group of people who do security stuff. And we don't talk or communicate as much as we should with the various other groups within our companies. This is a kind of a bad idea in my opinion. Because if I really want to know how an app works and how that app can be exploited or how that app can be endangered in some way, I need to talk to the application developer. I need to have a relationship with that person. And we need to have a conversation. And I need to be able to say, hey, we've got this really cool control system, like this WAF or whatever. Let's work together to figure out how to configure the WAF so that it protects your app. And likewise, I need to know from you what kind of things I should be watching out for. If you see your app start misbehaving, tell me, because then maybe, maybe we can find an attack earlier. Right? OK. There are some other people, too, that you might want to talk to. Um, marketing people, and, and I should say, all of these are based on things that I've actually seen be attacks, right? <laughs> the marketing people just did a big campaign, big sales campaign, and I get a call from the network ops people saying, our, our utilization on our websites has just gone up by 45%, what the hell's going on, right? Turns out, not an attack, just a good day, <laughs> right? 
Um, PR knows when they just did a press release. And sometimes that's because people are interested in your company, and sometimes it's because they've actually managed to anger somebody. <laughs> okay. Uh, sales, when they just did a big sale, right? Finance, earnings reports, et cetera. All of these different things, they all have situational awareness that might be useful to you as an as incident responder to know about so that you can accurately assess whether or not something's an attack. Or even better, you might actually find out about these things ahead of time so that you can actually get your monitoring, get your scaling uh, ready to go in case something happens. Oh, and of course, the, the most important one here is down at the bottom. Um, executives really do like to be kept in the loop. Uh, I think we all know that. It avoids um, having them come onto your conference calls and yell at you a lot. OK, so how do we make this happen? Um, the first step is clearly communication. Who is the security team? What kind of attacks is they, have they seen? Do a little bit of education. I would recommend not doing it in such a way that scares people, but just say, hey, we live in a world where we get attacked a lot. We need to prepare for it. Let's calmly and rationally figure out how we're going to handle this. Also, not blaming anybody, like, your web app is terrible, and we're going to get, eh, don't get that. No, just we're all trying to improve the business. We're all trying to support business goals. Let's work together to get this done. Um, and mainly saying the security team will need your help. And that's something else that I see a lot of security teams. And in fact, security teams that I've been on in my career, we have a tendency to kind of stride into the room and say, we're the security team, and you're going to do what we say. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes being told what to do. Um, make it a cooperation. Make it a, make it a partnership. And of course, pre-established ways that you can get a hold of people. This has been a really big thing in the incident responses that I've been involved in. Um, I tell somebody, okay, it would be really great to get a packet capture from the switch that's upstream from the device that we're looking at. Oh, that's the network ops team. Okay, well, can you get a hold of them? Uh, maybe, just a second. 10 minutes goes by. Um, th the one guy I know is on vacation. I, I don't know who else to call. Right, or it's, or it's three in the morning and they're all at home or whatever, right? Working those things out ahead of time uh, with your staff, with your non-IT staff, with your vendors, with your ISP, especially for volumetric attacks is gonna be really important. Depending on what kind of stuff your company does, maybe even law enforcement. You might wanna have the phone number of the FBI agent locally who might need to know about this. Coordination is super important too, and I would recommend, and I've seen some success with this, playing through attack scenarios on paper, wargaming it basically. I hate that term. Let's call it board gaming it. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, so basically just attack simulation. Attack simula yeah, it's still a little aggressive. Yeah, <laughs> tabletop, okay, we got that. Tabletop, tabletop the game out. Um, and try to figure out what kinds of capabilities you need but don't have and then how you can get them. Try to figure out what kind of data you'd want to see, but maybe you don't have quite at your fingertips yet, and figure out how to get it. Um, figure out what devices you don't have access to as a security team, and maybe get that access, or at least coordinate somebody who can get the data off of it that you need. Uh, and then you, of course, document, 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 document. And then everybody gets a copy of it, and everybody knows what's supposed to go on. That would be super helpful, I think. Um, because different groups of people need to be involved in different things. You know, a sin flood, okay, your ISP and your net ops. Probably those are the people who are going to be able to handle it. No need to necessarily involve the app people in that. But if it's a sophisticated attack against your customized web app, you might need to get everybody involved. You might need to get the PR group involved because your site's down and they got to figure out how they're going to respond to the media requests about why is your super cool site down, right? I mean... I don't know, maybe you work for Twitter and everyone's gonna freak out if Twitter goes down. And the third step, of course, is practice. And this is um, one of the things that, that is actually a little bit uh, difficult sometimes to sell. Um, a, a useful metaphor here is the way that emergency first responders deal with fires, specifically. Now, EMTs and firefighters respond to calls constantly, right? They're very, very busy. But you might be surprised to find out that only 1.5 of them, 1.58% of them per year are actually structure fires. Firefighters don't spend a great deal of time fighting fires. They are mostly doing other things. 
But when a structure fire does happen, they really need to know what they're doing. Um, because the, the, the downside of it is that maybe a whole block burns down, right? It's bad. So they spend a great deal of time drilling about how to fight fires. And I would say that drilling how to fight fires in your network, drilling how to do incident response, is really, really critical to making it something that you can just do, that you don't have to freak out about, that it doesn't have to be super stressful, that you can respond better and faster and you already have worked out the kinks in your problems uh, before, before you get to this point and make it a lot easier to deal with. Now, how often? Well, two things, actually. One thing is, this involves going to your boss and saying, I want to DOS our network. Can I do that? <laughs> okay, that can be kind of a hard sell. Some companies are better about this than others, but I think, I think there's ways to justify it. Or going to app owners and saying the same thing. But hopefully, most of us have test and dev environments that we could maybe use for this kind of thing once in a while. Um, and that might be helpful. Um, so how often? Uh, often enough to make it routine, right? I, I think doing it once a year probably is not uh, enough. Uh, doing it once a week is probably too much. Although maybe not for your actual incident response team, like your security team, but if you're going to involve everybody else, maybe too much. Once a month, once a quarter, I don't know, something. But enough, enough so that people don't forget between times what they're supposed to do. There's actually some really interesting research, mainly in the linguistic uh, world, ab about memory retention. Um, it turns out that, that uh, you can try to memorize, say, a, a bunch of words, and you'll remember them all in the short term very well, and then it, you'll forget almost all of them. But if you then refresh your memory, you'll remember them a little bit longer. So there's this idea of spaced repetition. Um, if you space it out, if you do it enough, you will actually memorize something. But it takes like six iterations usually before you do that. And you can't do them all at once. You have to do them once and then wait like a day or two and then do it like a week later and then do it a month later. And that's how you get things baked in your memory. I would suggest that, that doing this sort of thing is probably amenable to that as well. Do it frequently enough so that it doesn't completely fall out of people's brains, but not so much that they get overwhelmed by it. Um, just as a side note, working with vendors, uh, vendors can be critical partners. Um, there is one big thing that we run into a lot with our customers is that some customers have security protocols that say, we can't share data with you. That makes my job hard. And I understand. I mean, if you're a, if you're a, you know some kind of black ops site somewhere in the government or something like that, maybe I you know, I don't know. I for whatever reason, some companies don't feel comfortable or can't legally share data with me because it might contain personally identifiable information or IP or whatever they're protecting, and that's fine. Um, that does put me into a difficult position. So uh, if you are in this particular place. Um, Work out ahead of time how you can scrub or redact data so that you can share it with your vendors. Um, you may not be able to give them full packet captures, but maybe you can give them NetFlow data, um, which is just you know IP addresses and ports. Um, if you want to get sophisticated, there are a bunch of tools that can edit PCAPs and like say, you can give it a list of stuff that you want torn out of it, uh, regexes to clean it. Right? You can you can do some cool stuff with that. Um, maybe you can get your legal department to help you get NDAs so that you can share something with us. That'd be useful as well. Uh, and also, and I'll just appeal to everybody here, um, we're supposed to have SLAs as vendors. Hold us to them. If we say we're going to respond in an hour, make sure that we respond in an hour. It's, it's, it's our job to do that. So hold, us, hold our feet to the fire about that, please. Okay. So the goal, unless it's, uh, in, in case I haven't been clear enough, um, we want to try to make sure that, that handling network incidents gets easier. And the ways that we do that uh, is by making it something that is more than just the security operations team or the incident handling team or the security team or just the network team or what have you. Um, more hands are going to make lighter work. Um, what, we, what we are striving for here is quicker identification, quicker resolution, and making things not so much of an emergency. Um, now. That's kind of the, the, the high-level basic stuff. So let's dig into a little bit more interesting 
Thanks. Because running scenarios will help you get the basics sorted, and if you're doing that, you're going to be in a pretty good spot. But what about the weird things? What about the sophisticated attackers? Um, and in that kind of situation, you have to leverage something which is, which is honestly difficult to train for. Uh, this is where a quality people um, on your teams is going to really make a difference. Um, because you need to start getting clever with the data that you have. Maybe you don't have data that shows exactly what's going on, but maybe you can infer what kind of attack it is by what little data you do have. So I'm going to talk about a couple of different case studies here. Uh, the customer called. They said they were under attack. That's usually how the, how the calls start for me. Um, now, this is also something that tends to happen. The attack had already happened and was done with. It had subsided. Um, before they had actually gotten anything to uh, take any action on, uh, the attack was gone. And this happens for a bunch of reasons, but um, it's happening, I think, rather more and more. We're seeing an increase in, in spiky attacks. They hit you for a little bit, and then they go away, and they hit you for another little bit, and go away. Um, this may be an actual technique to try to screw around with incident response. <laughs> like. Uh, it may also be due to some technological things, which I can get into in a second. But the customer needed to prepare for the predicted return of the attack. And that's a pretty good thing. I mean, generally speaking, they are going to come back. It was This was a very, very, very big high traffic network. Uh, and it was um, what we would generally classify as a service provider of some kind. Anyways, giant network, tons of connections. Um, and they actually did have packet capturing capabilities. They had some sys central system that was going to capture packets on demand, and they seemed like they were pretty well set up, except that it was down during the attack. They didn't say why. Maybe it was maintenance. I don't know. But it was down. Murphy's Law plays a big, you know, plays, plays a big role in this sort of thing. So they didn't have any of the attack traffic captured. And I said, did you have anything? Like, is there any data that you can share with us that, 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 sh that took place during the time of the attack so I can help you out. And they said, actually, you know what? We're testing this new monitoring system that uses ICMP. We have full ICMP captures during the time. And I was like, wow, really? Nobody uses ICMP. <laughs> cool, OK, send me over them. So I took a look at them. It turns out that was actually really cool because um, the dumps that they gave me were full of ICMP error messages, just reams of them, right? IPv4 and IPv6. Um, and it was a large capture file, and it was almost entirely ICMP errors. And more importantly, it was almost entirely host unreachable, port unreachable errors. So at this point, I started thinking about what could possibly cause that in a network. Well, those errors are generated when you get a traf some kind of traffic that comes in and it's trying to go to a particular IP import that doesn't have a listener on it, right? So OK, that gives me one little bit of information. The funny thing, or the cool thing about ICMP uh, error messages of this type is that not only do they include the ICMP error message and, of course, all of the IP headers that go along with that, but they also include the IP header of the traffic that stimulated the error. And they include at least 576 bytes of the data portion of that as well. I'm not sure about that number. 562 bits? I don't know. There's some amount. So um, what did I know so far? Well, I've got traffic from port 53 UDP going to some random high port in their network. Um, oh, I see here it says 8 bytes. OK, I should probably read my slides more carefully. Anyways. It can, be, it can be a variable amount. Um, so what did I do? Well, uh, because I'm old, I fired up Perl, and I loaded a bunch of net modules, and I tore apart the packet capture, and I got rid of the IP header, and I got rid of the ICMP header, and what was I left with? Well, I was left with the actual attack traffic. Cool. Um, I had enough. It wasn't full. I couldn't reconstruct a PCAP from it, but I had the, enough of the attack traffic to be able to say, this was DNS traffic, OK? Moreover, this was A and quad A records. And it was DNS responses that was coming out. So I was able to conclude that what I was seeing was evidence of a reflected DNS attack. In other words, the attacker was from a spoofed IP that was spoofed to be the target. 
sending a request to a DNS server that was then sending a response to hit the target, right? And this showed up in the ICMP error logs. It's a very common attack technique. Um, you see it all the time, but it did give us some ability to be able to say, okay, well, what can we do to help with this, right? Well, we can, we can block DNS responses from coming into your network unless they're actually going to your DNS server that has a legitimate reason for making them. Or uh, we can improve your stateful, stateful, stateful firewall config to not ex to just drop packets that don't have some kind of a connection table entry that would indicate that you know it was an actual legitimate response. I was pretty happy about that. That one worked out pretty well. Um, it's actually gotten me to the point to say, you know, ICMP, that's been around since the beginning of the internet. Why are we turning that off everywhere? Well, there are some good reasons to not permit ICMP uh, to be emitted from your edge. Um, except for maybe doing um, uh, path MTU discovery. But inside your LAN, it can be very useful. You might want to think about not just turning it off. Uh, the next one was, was a fun one. Um, I was on the phone with the customer, and they were like, our switches and the proxy devices that I support were just kind of blowing up. They were having to reboot them all the time. The load was super high. What's going on? Uh, we think we're under a massive DOS. Help, help, help. OK. Uh, this was affecting their production. This was affecting their ability to serve up the web pages that they needed to serve up. Um, the customer really did not know uh, how to go about handling it at all, but they knew at least that the, the main indicator that they had was that their switches and this proxy was just freaking out, right? So that's where they focused their attention. So what I ended up doing was checking around the problem. Uh, essentially, right? Because it's good to get enough awareness of what's going on throughout the entire network to try to figure out how to deal with it. Um, the network device load was super high, but the inbound edge of their network was just normal. They had graphs for that. It was just the same kind of traffic that they always saw. Uh, and their application servers weren't heavily loaded either, even though people weren't able to get to the web pages. So that gave me a little bit of a tip that maybe it was actually constrained to just these two devices, right? Or at least somewhere in between the edge and the, the core. So I managed to get a quick PCAP, um, and I managed to see that the TCP sequence numbers were the same <laughs> a lot, even though there was, you know, from inbound and outbound. Uh, but the MAC and source addresses were swapping back and forth. Well, OK, so um, anybody care to guess what this was? Kind of routing loop. <laughs> um, well, so, uh, broadly speaking, a routing loop, I guess. Essentially, what was happening was the switch was sending to the proxy, which was sending to the switch, which was sending to the proxy, which was sending to the switch, so on and so forth. Uh, we corrected the configuration issue that was causing that, and everything went away. All right. Oh, OK, I'll tear through the rest of this. Um, some general discussion of specific issues. Uh, these are a few little techniques that I found useful in doing these sort of things. Um, if you do not, if you do not have the budget to do full-on packet captures for everything, or you don't have a ton of ability to do this, or actually, this is really specifically useful when you're doing a lot of cloud deployments. Um, you can do packet, you can do constant packet captures into essentially circular buffers. Uh, T Shark supports this. Uh, you can also uh, just have it configured to dump into a bunch of files. You can limit the file size automatically, and you can have it, you know, so you can have six files that are all 10 megs or whatever. If you have that constantly running, and you suddenly think, oh, I'm under attack, you've actually got attack data now. You don't actually have to go and start the capture and get it. You actually have the data that you need. So you just copy that over, snap it over, whatever you need to do to get it. Can be very useful. And simple counters are often overlooked, but they are often the way that we diagnose these things. How many HTTP requests are you getting? How many, how many TCP requests are you getting? You can have graph it, see trending data, right? Because all of a sudden, HTTP traffic, HTTP traffic, right? Now you know it's an HTTP attack. It, it seems really simple, but the number of times that I see people struggling to get this kind of data ahead of time is, is pretty big. Other things like average size of request, I mean, you can go really down the rabbit hole with this depending on what your applications are and what your sort of things are doing. But uh, this sort of simple counters and graphing can be super, super useful. Um, for a general methodology of how to assess network attacks that at least I've developed uh, when I'm talking to people is I ask the following questions in the following order. 
are your inbound or outbound pipes saturated? That tells me a bunch. That tells me whether or not um, I'm dealing with a giant volumetric attack or if I'm dealing with something else. Um, attacks can be both volumetric and something else, like a, I've seen brute force attacks against web servers that have actually filled network pipes. Not all attackers understand that they need to kind of keep it low and slow. <laughs> Some people just blast you. Um, also, volumetric attacks are a great way to conceal other things because you have the network ops team running around trying to deal with the, with the massive UDP flood and they're not going to see the attempts to compromise the web server using an O-Day or whatever. So it's a useful thing to know. Um, but it gives you some chance to prioritize what's important. Then I move up a level. Is it TCP? Is it UDP? Is it ICMP? Is it GRE? Whatever. Um, and then if that doesn't give me enough information, then I say, what else have been protocol? Is it, is it web? Is it SSH? Is it you know, whatever? Uh, and then finally, if I get to that point, um, do I need to actually get into, the, into encrypted traffic to figure out what's going on? So essentially what I'm doing here is I'm going from the easiest to the hardest. If at any point during this I can say, bingo, that is traffic that I can identify as being hostile in a very positive sense. Like I can distinguish that traffic from legitimate traffic, that's where I stop. That's where I start looking for mitigations. Right? Because I'm not going to go and do a full-on investigation of this if what I really want to do is just make it stop. So if I can get to the point where I can say, okay, we have something we can, we can hang our hat on, now let's immediately go and try to figure out what the best way to remediate this is, this is where I stop. Um, and usually that's by basing it on some kind of unique characteristic. Maybe all the attack traffic is coming from one IP. We actually see that. That's kind of weird, but we see that. Um, maybe it has to do with all of the attack traffic is HTTP and the host header is blank. We see that. Or it has a bizarre user agent string or whatever. You can generally eventually get to the point where you can figure out some way to block it. And if you can't, keep digging. I, I know this is a big thing. Um, encrypted traffic, everybody wants to encrypt everything. I am very much a positive fan of that. I think that's great. But you do actually need the ability to look into it sometimes. Um, you can do that uh, in a number of different ways, depending on your security policy. Um, this is where application logging, if you, if you happen to run custom apps, uh, this might actually be super useful if you have some logging capability in your app to actually dump out payloads of the request that it's handling. That way you don't have to like mess around with decrypting and re-encrypting to satisfy those requirements. Um, you can use uh, proxies. Um, such as the one that I work for <laughs> to do that though uh, and get insight into those traffics uh, or you can do things which I wouldn't recommend which is like downgrading the crypto so that you can capture the full handshake and use the RSA keys to get into it. E everyone should probably be using ephemeral Diffie Hellman and ECC or something along those lines that offers perfect forward secrecy so let's, let's try to avoid doing that. Along with that um, uh, cloud issues, everybody's moving to the cloud. The cloud is just a bunch of computers that you don't control. Yay. Um, but they do have dashboards and stats, uh, and you should know what those are and be able to leverage them. Um, one of the funny things about the cloud is that mitigations that you might have in your network are things that they offer as services. Hey, you might need to pay some money for those. There's basic firewalling, obviously. There's some other things like that. But I know Amazon and other cloud providers are providing uh, web application firewalls. Um, those may or may not meet your needs, but you should definitely check into them and figure out whether they're worth the money. And especially in DevOps environments, which I'll get to a little bit more in a second, um, you may not know where your cloud stuff is deployed, depending on your development model. Um, and you, they may or may not know how to turn on logging or do packet captures on those. Um, so, but if you can figure that out, script it, use orchestration, use Kubernetes, use Ansible, whatever to be able to like push a config that says, turn on debug logging and get me a packet capture. That would be useful, right? You can just do it like that. DevOps, or as I've recently heard it called, DevNetSecOps, <laughs> apparently we're converging, all of us, uh, is great, but it's increasingly replacing um, traditional functions of system administration and network administration, but it's replacing it with people who may not have the full set of skills in either one of those things, right? I mean, we have devs, and devs are able to now spin up 
instances in the cloud and do a bunch of networking with software-defined networking and so forth, and it works generally really, really well, and they don't have to worry about it, and that's great because we can reduce the amount of money that we're spending on network teams and sysadmin teams and so forth. Yay, okay. But what happens when it's a security thing? They don't necessarily know enough about it. Uh, they know how to spin them up. They know how to auto-scale them, and that can be useful during a DOS, but what happens if somebody is actually triggering a vulnerability in your app and knocking down all your instances? Who's the person that you go to to talk to about that? How do you get access to the configs? How do you make the changes that you need to do quickly? That's the question that essentially that I'm asking. Um, and sophisticated attacks here, really it's just distinguishable at L7 is how I would describe that, um, and able to change quickly. Uh, Oh, this is what I was gonna say. So what we're seeing a lot of is wave attacks. Um, there is some debate in the community about whether or not this is actually a technique or whether this is just a side effect. If it's a technique, what the attackers are doing is they are blasting you super hard. There's no ramp up. It's just like from zero to 100, boom, for a short period of time, and then they go away. And then six hours later, they come back, boom, go away. It's super disruptive to your business. It reduces the amount of time that you have to do anything. It's actually a pretty effective attack technique. Some people who, who study this stuff think that it's an actual technique. Some people think it's because the botnets that are doing this are just blasting giant net blocks. And when they sweep around to your little bit, you see it, and then they go on to the next part, and it goes away. Don't know. Either way, the effect is the same, though. <coughs> But in these situations, especially and especially attackers who are actually trying to trigger vulnerabilities, you absolutely need to have tight relationships with your app teams to be able to address these. Okay. That was a little bit unfocused and all over the place, but I hope you enjoyed it. Um, Essentially, the main things that I'd like you to take away from it are there, there aren't any vendor magic bullets for this stuff. There are tools that can be helpful. There are definitely tools that can give you insight and the ability to manipulate traffic in your networks in ways that can be very useful, but you still obviously need people who know how to use them and can uh, do this sort of thing. And that incident response absolutely needs to be a function not only of your security team, but also of just about everybody else. Um, that analysis and response uh, is better done by the subject matter experts than the security team. So if you work in cooperation, you're gonna get better results. And that the means to do this is by communicating ahead of time, establishing relationships with those groups, and doing some, uh, we're gonna pretend we're under attack while not being under attack scenarios so that you can get all the bugs worked out early you can deal with the easy to deal with attacks quicker and better, you can be less stressed out, and then you'll still have the energy to be able to deal with the really sophisticated attacks that you might get. So that's what I've got to say. We have two minutes for questions if anybody has any, or you can all go out and get some coffee or whatever you want. So thanks very much for coming. Anybody have a question? Yes. Um, I can get you these slides if you found them useful. We are also re being recorded. So depending on how well the recording turns out, I probably could get you a copy of that too. Um, yeah. And, and, if, and if you want to like, give me your card or whatever, I'll make sure I can get you this material. Anybody else? No? All right, cool, thanks.